I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com. Before we get started, just a reminder that if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Gareth, thank you so much for being here online with me today. Oh, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, hopefully we're going to have a fun conversation today. We're, we're actually picking it up from toward the end of January, I think was the last time we spoke. And you were actually one of the very first people I talked to about the silver squeeze, which was really picking up traction then. So we saw a move in silver around that time. Then we saw silver go down since about April or so we've seen it moving up. So first question I wanna ask is prospects for silver in Q2, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so, so silver definitely has been on the rise over the last probably month or so, grinding up. And um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll show my screen here. I think you guys will find it really fascinating to take a look at the SLV chart, which is the silver ETF. And what you can see here is that silver has been trading in a range. And this is actually a bullish consolidation pattern. So if I zoom out, you can see here the low pivot from March 2020 and then the big move up. And then since then, it's been digesting that move. And, and stocks and commodities and currencies do this type of thing where they have a big move and then they need to digest it, kind of like a runner running a marathon. You can't run back-to-back -back marathons. You got to take a break. You got to refuel. Then you can go on your merry way. So what I'm watching for here on silver is that you have a very defined kind of wedge pattern. And here you can see the previous top over here in kind of uh, July, August of last year. And then this was the Reddit crowd kind of pumping it up, trying to do the squeeze. It, it ultimately failed at the time. Uh, and then we came back in. But notice the pivot lows here, pivot low, pivot low and pivot low. And that's the latest low we hit and we're starting to rise. So what you're going to look for here on the silver chart is very simple to follow. When you take out this trend line here to the upside, you're going to get a break to the upside on silver and a big breakout at that. So the pattern is bullish. It's telling us that the move up is coming. If you want to be safe, wait for it to break above this trend line and hop on board. And you could be looking at, you know, a two year price target, maybe of as high as, you know, 45 to $50 on silver. So it could be really remarkable um, in terms of the move that we could get here. Right. That's really interesting. And I think, you know, you're talking about $40 or so and people are mostly worried about when are we going to get past 30? So that's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, I think so. That was a chart for SLV. And one thing that we've seen this year is definitely the retail demand for the physical silver. So maybe we should take a moment to talk about are we I guess how the physical demand is related to demand for the ETFs and things like that. How do those things interact? Yeah, so they absolutely interact, right? So, so people want to have physical in their hands because it's something that they can hold, they can feel. You, know, you can feel the weight of that, that ounce of silver in your hand as well. Um, so you're going to have always that demand. For instance, I love keeping silver and gold, you know, the physical with me, um, obviously locked away in, in safe locations. But, but I also do investments where I'll buy the ETFs to play them because it's very easy to trade in and out of those versus selling your silver that's physical. So that's really the, the kind of the, the difference there. It's, it's how fast are you looking to exit? If you're going to hold for a long-term investor type mentality, then buying the physical is awesome. If you're going to look to exit it really quickly, you don't wanna go sell it to a buyer and then they, they're, gonna, they're gonna knock you off the price in terms of what kind of cut that they wanna take of that. So I think that's the key there. Um, one thing to note, which is fascinating, is that the crypto bull market we have seen is really a very positive thing for the metals market. Now, a lot of people would say, oh, well, you know, the crypto market has taken a lot of money away from the metal market. But in reality, it's made this, the younger generations, the 20 year olds, the 30 year olds, very aware of diversifying out of dollars. Now, right now, the crypto market has pulled a ton of those, those investment dollars into it. But eventually, as the crypto market cools and pulls back, you're going to see people saying, OK, well, I don't want to hold dollars. I know the Federal Reserve is printing tons of money and probably will continue. So where is where am I going to put my money now? And gold and silver will be a definite recipient of the younger generations. And it's a great thing overall. 
Yeah, and that actually ties into something else I wanted to bring up. I mentioned we were last speaking around the start of the Silver Squeeze, which is, of course, when all the GameStop activities started going on. And one topic that we discussed a little bit is retail investor movements and what the longer term impacts of these, these movements could be. So it sounds like that is one aspect of what we could see going forward. Is there anything else you would talk about there? Yeah, so that's definitely one aspect. And, and I just think in general, it's healthy for the long term market in not just the stock market and the commodities market, but investing overall to to get these periods, even though, you know, the price on GameStop when it was close to $500 was ludicrous. It's obviously come in significantly. It probably will come in more. But what it does is it kind of gets this, the, the newer investors to start thinking about investing. So whether it's the stock market and individual stocks or metals, you want new investors to start investing. That creates um, potential for future growth in the stock market and, and really just a good, healthy thing overall. I mean, if anyone wants to retire, you, know, you, you really can't retire by just saving your money. You're going to have to invest it over time. So it's that exposure, that education. You hope that everyone goes out and learns. I can't tell you how many investors, you know, they, they think, you know, after trading over the last six months, they're like, oh, I'm a genius. But it's it's been in a bull market. You know, once we get in these harder markets, you've got to get educated. You got to learn how to read the charts, understand the fear and greed indicators, and that'll help you really profit in all types of markets. Right. And speaking about the need to invest in order to increase your money, I think one concern we're seeing a lot right now is inflation. So maybe we can start talking about that and where you see inflation going this year? I know it's something that the Federal Reserve doesn't seem too concerned about at the moment. Yeah, or at least they're not letting on that they're concerned about it. I think that it's a cat and mouse game with the Federal Reserve where, you know, they might be concerned about it. But if they say they're concerned about it, the markets will freak out and, and have a major collapse. So that's the tricky thing is, is as an investor, we have to kind of decide what the truth is and then position ourselves as carefully as we can to 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 be safe in these situations. Um, I think the fact that Janet Yellen mentioned interest rates going up last week wasn't a fluke, even though she walked it back. I look at I look at the Federal Reserve as an entity that slowly wants to warm the water up for the market. You know, if, if the market's someone getting into water, you don't want ice cold water or super hot water. They've got to do it slowly so you get accustomed to it. So, you know, a Fed president might say, oh, yeah, we may raise interest rates at some point in the future. But Jerome Powell's like, no, no, no. You know, let's, you know, trying to keep the calm. And then Janet Yellen says it. And then it slowly gets the market to become more accustomed to this idea. Uh, ultimately, interest rates have to go up. I don't think you can print as much money as they have and have as much stimulus as the government has done run up the national debt like this, um, other countries are not going to continue to loan us money for, for tiny interest rate returns. Right. And, you know, I guess tying this into gold, which we have to make sure to cover as well, you, you we hear about gold as a hedge against inflation or an investment for when interest rates are low. And yet some people are still, I guess, disappointed to see it below last summer's all time high. So, what is your perspective on what's going on with gold and what may happen moving forward this year? Yeah, gold is one of the coolest charts right now. And I got to show you guys this because it is that cool. Um, so if you look at the gold chart, it's basically replicating the same situation that occurred in like the 2007, eight ish period, where you could see you had this 1979, 1980 high on gold. And then when you came up to that same high in 2008 ish, you broke it briefly, and then you had this retrace back down before a bigger breakout to the upside. And then what's so cool here is that we've done the exact same thing from the high here, which was what, in 2009, maybe 2008, and, and we broke it recently over the last six months or so with that big move up, and then we're doing the same retrace. And it happens to be a Fibonacci 382 retrace, um, and we basically come down to the target, and now we're starting to see we're starting to see the move up on gold start, which should replicate the move up here beautifully to the upside uh, of this latest breakout. So again, look for that to occur. Look for a move up significantly in gold over the next year or two. I actually have a chart that pinpoints potential targets. And let me bring that up for you guys here. 
Um, here it is. So basically, if you take the low of 260 to the high here of 1920, and then you take 1200. So this, this move here was a $1,660 move up. You would take this low, which was the lowest pullback over the last five, seven years, and you would add that same 1660 to it, and you'd get a target of $2,860, giving you a beautiful price target on gold of just shy of $3,000 um, per ounce. And I love that stuff. I love doing these types of charts because it's amazing. If you think about, you know, here you have gold replicating exact to, to basically the, the T exactly what it did the last time it broke above its high with it pushed through, then it pulled back. Everyone said, oh gosh, it's not, you know, it's, it's a failed breakout. And then it just started to zoom higher. And that's what I actually think will happen to gold. And I think it's one of the easiest trades because you know, the government's going to have to print more money. You know, you, they have to do it. They have to pay the, the, the interest on the debt. It, there's no way around it at this point. Yeah, I, that's a great chart to look at. And thanks for sharing that. It's hard to argue with the chart, but probably what we should talk about is also what are the risk factors for gold? What are things that could throw it off its, its trajectory? Yeah, so absolutely. What we, what we know is that you know, there, there's always risk factors in, involved in it. So you have to just say to yourself, okay, if for some reason, you know, the printing of money stops, you know, or, or if they really put the brakes on the debt and they start reducing it by extremely, you know, higher taxes, I mean, those type of things would kind of get my attention. I don't personally think that will happen, but it is a, it is a problem. The other thing, it's a very long-term thought, but, you know, in the next 50 years, if, if Elon Musk starts mining gold on asteroids, I mean, you know, they, they say there's, there's asteroids out there that have more gold than, they, than on the entire planet. You know, those would be something where I would say, okay, let's get out of gold. We'll find something else and, and, and we'll, we'll invest there. But that's so far off. I don't think it's an issue at this point. Okay, really interesting. And another question that I have is given the environment that we're in, of course, our audience loves to hear about gold and silver and the benefits there. What other assets fit this environment that you would look at and say that's something to consider right now? It's one of the trickiest questions. And it's a question that I'm constantly kind of thinking about uh, every single day, because there's not a whole lot of places like, you know, normally I would say Bitcoin last year in early, early in the year when Bitcoin was sub 10,000, I was hugely bullish on it, but at these current levels, I can't justify it. It's too crowded of a trade. I have to wait for it to pull back significantly. If it had a 50% correction, which is very normal for, for Bitcoin historically, I would absolutely say Bitcoin is another area. Other cryptocurrencies that are best to breed would be. Um, but other than that, it, it's hard to think about because uh, you know it's, it's, it's in a situation where every asset is so inflated. Um, that I, I just don't like it. The one area I do think is, is potentially interesting is Chinese stocks and, and the China market. Um, I've likened the China market to the Bitcoin chart. In fact, if you look at the, the Chinese chart, in fact, I got to show this to you guys because it's just so cool. So bear with me here. Let me just bring up this chart again for you guys. So, and let me share my screen. But basically you have a Bitcoin chart that had this beautiful wedge pattern here. And we all know what happened to Bitcoin, right? It just, it went gangbusters to the upside going from basically $10,000 to $65,000. Now, what's so cool is what you can do is look at the Shanghai composite chart in China. And right here, you can clearly see, and I'll even zoom in on it a little bit, is that you have the same, like to a T, the same pattern here. And what that tells me is that, you know, as money, let's say the US economy obviously is seeing so much inflow of money, but we see that, you know, over time, the growth rate in the, in the reopening starts to slow. Where is money going to go? And my guess is it's going to be going towards the Chinese market. That'll be the direct recipient. And you could be looking at a major Bitcoin-ish type move on the Shanghai composite over the next three to five years. So you could be talking about the Shanghai composite, which is right around 33, 3400 right now. You know, you could be talking about 20,000 on the Shanghai composite. Now, again, that's a three to five year time horizon. It's not an instantaneous gratification type trade, but in an environment where it's very hard to find investments, it is one that I'm absolutely honed in on. And I'm slowly accumulating a lot of these Chinese stocks that, that trade in the US markets over it. 
Are you able to go into a little more detail on what kind of stocks? Because China is obviously a big market, big country. What are you looking at specifically? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, so I would generally choose best of breed. You know, try to stay away from the micro caps because you know part of the part of the reason why money isn't going into China as much is number one, China restricts the amount of of capital that can come in from outside their country, but also the transparency has always been an issue there. So, you know, what's their accounting? Standard? Standards. Uh, we know that the SEC recently has said that if the, the stocks that trade in the U.S. that are Chinese stocks, if they don't uh, report accounting standards equal to what the U.S. companies report, then they could be delisted in three years. But if you go to names like Alibaba and Baidu um, and, and names like that, you're going to get the best of breed. And because of that risk, I would definitely look to focus on the best companies out there. And a lot of them are trading down, you know, 30, 40, 50% from their recent highs. So I wouldn't say go all in here, but what you can do is over, you know, every month, just put a little in play, a little bit more every month, accumulate, get that kind of like dollar cost average down and position yourself for that bigger move that could be coming in the Shanghai over the next few years. Okay, and one more question as we talk about, you know, where to put your money right now, you mentioned it's hard to find places. Are there any benefits to being in cash right now? There's always a benefit to being in cash. And the, the benefit is that if a new opportunity arises, you can jump on it. So I, I think that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned when I was younger as an investor or as a trader is that I, I would be, you know, I would be in like a few stocks and I'd be like, oh, these stocks are going to make me millions. And then, you know, they wouldn't, they'd just be sitting there and all of a sudden a great opportunity would arise in another stock and I, I had no capital to put to use. So you do want to keep some cash on the sidelines. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people have asked me, you know, what about housing? Well, housing, you know, it, to me, it's too lofty. I mean, you have the lumber prices up 350%, which is driving home prices up on the other side of the coin. If interest rates are going up, the cost of a mortgage is going to go up. So I'm not a big fan of housing, but but I do think it's important to keep some cash on the sidelines because, I mean, you never know, right? I mean, NFTs are something that are just emerging. I would have never thought about that in 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 ever, you know, in my in my last few years. But that's someplace where there's millions of dollars apparently being made. So good to have money on the sidelines just in case. OK, well, you've given us a lot of things to think about. And I wonder, just before we wrap up, if there's any final thoughts you would leave investors with as we're heading into Q2, into the rest of the year in a very interesting market. Yeah, so I would say continue. I continue to like gold. Um, I think that gold is going to be a safe haven. I'm expecting a very rocky second half of the year for the stock market. So I think money could come out of that. I also think that the risk appetite has pushed capital from gold, which is kind of boring, going up or down a percent here and there, to the crypto market. I think you'll see a pullback on crypto and money will flood into, into gold uh, as a play there as well. And I think the, the concerns over inflation will mount in the second half of the year as well with these crazy moves in lumber, steel, uh, copper, all these type of moves should, should be very good for the, the metals overall. Okay, well, that sounds like a great point to end it on. Thank you so much for being here to talk about what's going on in gold and silver. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Gareth Soloway with InTheMoneyStocks.com.